Okay, we're back today, and um, let's let's give it a let's give a shot to uh, a new topic here. We're going to be learning a few different things today, and one of them is uh, going to be generator functions. So so far, when you've been learning functions, uh, a function, let's say, like if I if I was to um, make a function, let's say, called uh, foo here. Uh, a function, f the function foo, usually functions return something. So, uh, you know, what's important about to understand about returning something is that if we call the function, we get the result back of whatever the function returns. And the function is over. If we call it again, the function starts from the beginning and executes the whole function again. So it's like when you call the function, the function has to run from beginning to end. And when you hit, the, when you hit a return, the function's over. And when you call it again, it does the same thing. But there is a type of a function called a generator function which instead of yielding, infer sorry, which instead of returning information in a one-shot affair, it will yield information or data and it will remember where it was and continue from that point on. Case in point, take a look at this function I have written here called INF, which stands for infinity. It, the function accepts nothing. It says x equals 0. Then it goes into a while true loop. It increments x. And then it yields x. Now I can change this. Let's, why don't we change it? Because let's start from 0. So why don't we go yield x. And then um, let's go x equals uh, x plus 1 or plus equals 1. Okay? Now, you see, the thing about calling inf now is watch what happens. So this is a generator function. So if I call the, in, it just says generator object. Okay? However, if I was to go for num in infinity and I provide the function call to infinity there and I go print uh, num. Now this is going to blast past my screen as you can see. I had to hit control C to stop that. Um, but, I mean, I can make it slow down just by putting an input statement in here and watch what happens now. Okay? So, in fact, I can't call it, it's not quite like a regular function where I could call it uh, directly because it's a generator object. So I'm going to go control C again. So in other words, a regular function, as I make a regular function call, right? So if I go, if I said type foo, it says it's a function. If I go type, type is a, it is a Python command that will allow you to determine what type of a, an object a variable is. So inf is a, well, oh, it is also a function, but it's a generator function more specifically. So you can't call it directly like this, like you can a regular function. You have to iterate over it. However, if you were to um, set it equal to, if you set that function equal to a variable, let's say um, I said g equals inf, now I can actually call an iterator um, I can call iterator next which is a method that is used for 
iterators and that will work. Okay, so let's kind of show you what an iterator with next is. Uh, I can make it. I can make a list here, and um, let's go three, five, six, not eight, and you know that's good enough. Now I can I can now create. Uh, let's say little l equals iter big L. Now if I call next on uh, little l, that works. It'll go 3, 6, and when I get to the end, look what's going to happen now. It's going to throw an exception. It's going to call a stop iteration exception. It's because there's nothing more for me to iterate through. I only have three things in here. Okay, so back to the generator function. The generator function um, INF, I think I made, yeah, I, I said uh, G equals INF. So if I call next on G now, it's going to work, and it'll work forever. Okay, because that's, that's an infinite... Uh, generator function and I've turned it into uh, I've, I've made it iterable by saying G was equal to it so if you remember I, I did this and so now as soon as you assign it to a variable that that generator function INF now you can call next on it okay this is kinda of cool too you know what it's kinda of cool for watch this if I make a uh, a list called let's say Monday uh, Tuesday Wednesday Thursday uh, Friday oh, I can't type okay that's good enough uh, I think you get the idea so now I can do something like for uh, day in week and I can go print day. That works. I can iterate through the list like that. But sometimes you don't you don't want to iterate through it. But but you might be somewhere in your code where you specifically want the next day, but you don't want it at regular intervals. You might only want it, let's say, if an if statement occurs or something, and um, you want the next day. You could use an index, and and you could say you know um, something like uh, so, you know something like d equals zero, and then you might say uh, give me week d. Okay, and then you you could say something like d plus equals one, and then you'd say give me week d. And then you could say plus equals one, and then you could give weak D. Well, this is essentially doing the same thing. If I was to change that weak list up at the top on line 39 up here into an uh, iterator by going calling the uh, iter command in Python. So let's say I could call it um, I weak for okay equals iter weak and so now I can um, call next on I weak and when I continue calling next it's always going to give me the next one okay now obviously this is going to have an, throw an exception or error after you get past the last day. There is a way to um, kind of get around this so that you circle around. Now obviously uh, I would have to, it wouldn't make much sense if I 
after obviously after Friday comes Saturday and Sunday. But um, you can actually do something called import iter tools. Oops. And there is something called cycle in there. Actually, I'm going to import iter tools as it because iter tools is a lot of, uh, a lot to type. Now you guys should know what that means now when you import something as. And so right now, um, if I was to um, go it.cycle, now if you're wondering what iter tools has, you could go help uh, it. And the one I'm going to show you is this one. There's a whole bunch that you can look at and go through. Um, it's a quite a it's a very useful uh, module. Okay, so in this situation, week is a list here, and now if we go, um, let's say uh, if we're going to change this thing into an iterator, we would say, um, let's say p equals iterator dot cycle. And then we'll say week. And so now I can call, because now p is a iterator, I can call next on p. And it'll give me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But now look what happens. If this was a regular iterator, if I had just used iter, if I said p equals iter week, if I hit it again, it's going to go, um, it's going to say, uh, it's going to say stop iteration error. But if I hit it again, it starts back from Monday again. So this basically, once it gets to the end, it starts from the beginning again. It just keeps going. So all you have to do is keep calling next, next, next. And that does make sense like for a week, right? Because obviously, in this case, it's not correct because the last day of the week is not Friday. It's like Sunday, right? You go Monday to Sunday seven days of the week, and then you start from Monday again. I just have to redefine what uh, week was, because I only have week being Monday to Friday. But the nice thing about this is, is that I imported iter tools, and then I'm using iter tools dot cycle to change the list week into a iterator, which cycles back to the beginning when it gets to the end. So that, I thought that was kind of cool, and um, that's kind of a neat thing to teach, right? Whereas if I did the same thing, right, where I said i equals iter week, and then I said next i, now once it gets to the last day, and now it's going to fail because iter will not, um, will not cycle back. Right? Whereas this one, I have to import iter tools though for this to work. Remember, IT stands for iter tools. Okay? That's how I imported it. I said import iter tools as IT because I was lazy. I don't want to type in iter tools all the time. Um, yeah. So, for example, Let's say you wanted to um, have a uh, you know a list of let's say um, a million things, okay? And now, are you are you going to create a, a list of a million things? Well, with a a generator function, we can actually yield one number at a time without creating without having to store a million numbers in memory. And so the way we would do that is we would say uh, def and um, let's call it million or just let's call it mil. Or you know what, how about we pass the number to it? How about let's call it, uh, it's, it, it's essentially like doing range, right? So let's call it uh, my range and let's let's send the number n to it 
Now I would say, um, the first thing I would say is x equals 0. And then I would say, while x is less than uh, n, then I would say uh, yield x. And then I would say uh, x plus equals 1. It doesn't have to be 1, but good enough. And so now, you see, if I did for uh, num in my range, and obviously here I could put in any number I want. I could put 9 million. But for now, let's just do 9. And, and so now if I did print num, uh, that works. Notice that works exactly like range does. OK? So this is, this is a generator function here because each time it yields a new, it doesn't, gener it doesn't create the entire list of nine numbers all at once. It's only supplying one number at a time. Whereas, you see, before in our um, example here, we, we can do the same thing. We can create a generator function for a week as well. Although, like I said, it's kind of pointless because the list already exists. But that's OK, because what I can do here is I could, I could, pass, I could pass in an iterable, right? I could say something like, uh, to make a generator function, instead of calling it um, next, let's call it another. And let's pass in an iterable. And now let's go for uh, item in iterable. Oops. Uh, yield item. OK? And so, so now. Uh, this is a generator function, right? So for example, I, st I think I still have week, right? So how about I say day equals, because right now I can do four, I can do four uh, day in another week, and then I can go print uh, day. That's going to work. Okay. But if I now assign another week, because another week is an iterable. So if I assign it to a variable, let's say, uh, let's say I'll use the variable, let's say d, let's say d equals uh, another week. Now I can, I can call next on D. So if I go next D, there you go. So this is exactly the same, right? And then I get the iterate. So this is exactly the same as going um, D equals uh, iter week, right? And then I go next D. Oops, I uh, messed up. There we go. Okay. However, I have a question. If we, you know, we, we've imported, uh, we went import iter tools. Okay, as uh, IT. Now, iter tools has something called cycle. So if I said, for example, D equals iter tools dot cycle week, week is the list, right? 
And now if I go if I call next D, I get Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but now look what happens. Next D, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and now look what happens. Monday again. So now instead of having a stop iteration exception, it just continues. Now how would we do this by writing the another, do you remember we wrote that another uh, function? Where was that? Here it is. How could we do this? I'll pause the video, uh, you pause the video and see if you can figure out how to modify the another function such that it works just like cycle. Pause the video now. Okay, let's see if you got it. So essentially what cycle is doing here is it's going while true and then it's saying for item in iterable yield item. Basically it never ends. So now if I say for example um, I think I said uh, so my week is still a list so if I say D equals um, another week and now if I say next D Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and then Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. Perfect. So essentially, you know, with this generator function, which has yield in it, and by the way, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, whenever a function has yield in it, it's, it becomes a generator function. Okay, so that's the, that's the criteria for becoming a generator function is if it has yield. And so this generator function um, is, is, an, is, is, is an iterator. We're using it just like uh, iterTools.cycle. Well, that's kind of cool, right? Like with three lines of code. Um, so, okay, so next my little assignment for you guys was, do you remember we wrote the, the Fibonacci function a while ago and uh, let's say we go fib and um, uh, I think it was um, something like we wanted to get n Fibonacci numbers well can you write do you remember though the Fibonacci function how that worked is we said like a equals 0 and then we said B equals 1 we had to set the first A and B and then after that we were like um, 4 X in N and then we said uh, uh, something like print well we would have to print something right here we could, we could just print A I suppose and then um, then we would go A comma B. Remember the trick we did with the dual assignment at the same time? Um, A equals B and then uh, B is equal to A plus B, right? So if we did that and, um, well, I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have done print, but it, it's okay. Uh, if I go fib now, something like, you know, the first, eight numbers uh oh uh oh yeah yeah right 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 I didn't do this I should have done range n okay let's try that again oops so we'll go fib eight All right, how about just six okay so there you go that looks correct. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to change this 
into a generator function that yields Fibonacci numbers so that we could call, so essentially, you know, um, we could generate an infinite number of uh, Fibonacci numbers if we wished. Okay? So change this into a generator function. And, um, yeah. Good luck. Try it. Pause the video now. All right. So it's not that tough, actually. So all we got to do is come back here to the function. And instead of printing A, we would just yield A. And so now, if we do this, now fib becomes a generator function. And so we could go something like, um, now we can't remember that you can't just go, if it's a generator function, you can't go fib 6. That's, that's just going to give you a generator object. So in order for this to work, you would go for num in fib 6. And then you'd go print num. OK, so that would work. OK? And then the other option, right, is if you assign it to something, we can't, we can't call next. We, we wouldn't be able to call next on a, a generator function by going, we can't do this. OK, but what we can do is if we assign it to something, like let's say we assigned it to a capital F, and we went F equals fib 6. Now we can go next F, capital F. Okay, so that is working. Except, look what happens though. We get stop iteration error again. So in other words, next isn't going to work forever. How could we modify? this function here such that we don't provide an argument. So we don't want to be limited. See, this is the cool thing, right, about generator functions, is that now you can basically make it go on kind of forever. We don't want it to be limited by n. So now what would how? In other words, I'm not going to do this for you. You try and do it. All I'm, all I'm saying is take away the argument so no argument is passed. I want it to print Fibonacci numbers ad infinitum, which means, for those of you that are not sure what that means, it means forever. So pause the video now and try modifying that function such that it, it return or it yields Fibonacci numbers forever. Pause it now. Try. OK, well, I hope you figured it out. It wasn't hard. You just replace the 4x in range with while true. And so now, if you hit it and you say uh, d equal, or no, sorry, not d. Um, let's say capital F equals fib, uh, like that. We're not passing anything to it. And then we went next f. Yay, it works. And so now, you know, you could just keep, you could keep uh, generating Fibonacci numbers for as long as you want. It's essentially like doing a print right in here, which would, you know, if you did that, it would generate them forever as well. The cool thing about this is you can call this next f whenever you need another Fibonacci number in the sequence. So it's very convenient sometimes in, um, in, uh, in your code to be able to do this. And, and what's different about this specific case, right, is that we're not, we're not iterating through uh, a list of like days of the week, but rather we're generating the next value 
as we go along. Okay, and it's not just plus one plus one either. So, okay, so the next topic we're going to do is try accept. And essentially, what it is, it's a way of capturing errors that would cause your program to crash you can actually capture them and do something specific if your program crashes. So let's take a look at some different types of exceptions. But actually, no, before we take a look at these types, this is a, this is a website, it's the built-in exceptions in Python. Before we do that, let's actually just make a generic one. So uh, how about I, I, did, I do something like, uh, here, here's a try accept block. So first you say try, and now we'll go something like uh, let's let's how, how about let's just dump the contents of a file. Okay, let's go f equals open, and let's call it um, non. Or actually, let's make it a yeah sure. Let's make it non-existent. Existent. Okay, and then let's just go. Uh, something like well actually we don't need to do anything after this point right um, we could also do use the with open right we could go with open as F and then we could just say something like print F dot read okay done now we could say accept and now now the thing about the accept part is uh, we could say we could we could put an, an error message here we could say print uh, file does not exist So, but before I do this, let's just try and run this without the try and accept. Okay, so actually, I'm gonna, well, no, let's just try it with it first and then we'll try it without. Okay, so let me run this. And now when I run it, it just says file does not exist. But if I take away this and I take away this and I, uh, actually, well, okay, I'm gonna have to go. Okay, so if I just run it now, look what happens. It says, no, with open, no such file or directory, non-existent. Now, I purposefully named the file non-existent because I knew I, that I don't have a file called non-existent. That's why I called it non-existent, because I know it doesn't exist, just for to be fun. But the point now is that Sometimes, you know, if you want to do something, you don't want your program to simply crash. So what I'm doing here by putting in these, this try accept uh, block is I'm saying, listen, if it fails, don't crash my program. Do something specific. Okay? Uh, so that's essentially what the try accept is but there is a there is another one ready watch this now I'm gonna change this from instead of going with open because that closes it automatically right how about I how about I do this I'll say F equals open and then I will say uh, print F dot read and um, and then let's see here. If it fails, what if I okay? So and then watch this. Here I'm gonna say uh, finally. Well, I might want to save the file perhaps, but the finally will always happen. Anyways, here's the finally. Um, F dot close. 
So finally always happens. Executes. Finally always executes. Okay? So watch this. I'm now going to run this and it says, oh wait, I think I have a, a problem here. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Okay, so what happened here is obviously this line number three uh, didn't work. Okay, so if I'm now going to try and close it, it says F is not defined because line three did not succeed. Okay, so in this case, my program failed. Uh, it's, it said file does not exist, so this did get printed here, file does not exist, but then finally executed. And it tried to close the file that I wasn't able to open. So maybe this isn't a very good example. Um, what I'm trying to show you is that there might be a situation in which you need something done whether or not it's successful. Um, in my idea, it was f.close. Now, uh, if I was to have another file, let's just see here. If I, um, let me get out of this here and go into, oops, uh, my directory. Do I have any thing? So let me just create a file here. Uh, how about let's just go text. And I'll go, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And let's all save that. So that text is now saved. So at this point, I'll change this to text. OK? And if I run this, it prints blah, 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 but um, the file was closed here on line 10. And I could put a print here. Let's say print uh, closing file. There. OK. Um, obviously, it's if if the try do, if the try fails, then the close is going to fail as well. But there might be situations where you need a finally to to always run. Okay, and that's what it's for. In other words, if this try was successful, finally will run. If it's not successful and there's an error, finally will run as well. So finally will always run. But with these exceptions, let's take a look at what types of exceptions there are. So now we'll come over here and we'll say, let's scroll down here a little bit. And so there are uh, lookup errors, lookup error. So let, I'll, I, can, I can actually, um, what's the word, generate these errors for you. And it's nice to see how, they're, how, how they are um, generated. So let me start IPython, and I'll show you. I'll generate an error. So if I create a dictionary, and I put something in there like this, and now let me do a lookup. Let me look up A. No problem. That works. Let me look up B. And that's a key error. Okay, so we could come here and look up key error. Okay, there it is, key error. Whereas when a mapping dictionary key is not found in the set of existing keys, that's the reason why we had. Remember, we had. Um, oh, not here. We had. Uh, that if statement, if 
you know, B in D, then, if only then, look it up. Because if it's not in there, right, that's the way we did error checking. But we can... Okay, so let's take a look at uh, try accept, where we have some... I just typed these up where I know these are going to fail. So let's take it this let's take a look at this first one here. Open non-existent file. Obviously, uh, I ha what I have here is a try block. Everything's commented out cuz we'll go through them one by one, but here I'm catching a specific type of an error which is a keyboard interrupt error and once again I can actually uh, look those up here right on this page and I can I can uh, find the types that I want to catch in the description of what they are but in this program uh, keyboard interrupt is basically when you hit control C on your keyboard to stop a program so essentially I'm going to disable stopping the program with control C I'm also going to specifically catch a zero division error and just print infinity so if I try to divide by zero, then instead of throwing, uh, instead of you know printing out the error that I get, I'm going to just print infinity. But um, the last one is exception as e. So accept exception as e. In this case, e is just a is going to be the error object, and I'm going to print out the type of the error and the the error message. So um, if I run this first one where I'm trying to open a file that doesn't exist. Oh, and by the way, one more thing. The last line of my program here is uh, an input line, which just means that my program hasn't ended. So essentially, if you don't see still running, it means my program actually crashed for real and the try block did not work. So let's run it. And it says still running, which is good. Um, but it says no such file or directory. Okay, so my program's over. So that one was for uh, f dot open a file that doesn't exist. Let's try the next one where I'm trying to add a string and an integer. Let's run that one. It says a type error must be string not int. Okay, so let's take that one out and now let's do the division by zero error and if I if I run that one it prints infinity so that's a special case I didn't actually catch it down here with line 23 I actually caught it on line 20 and and I'm doing a very customized uh, thing for that uh, the next error that I want to show you is if you import something that just doesn't exist and it says module not found error, no module named coffee. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm basically the output you're seeing is from line 24 there. Uh, the next one is I'm going to try and access an element in a list that doesn't exist. So give me the ninth element of, only, of a list that only has three things in it. Index, error, list index out of range. Okay. And the next one is, well, how can I say y equals y plus 1 when y is not defined? Let's try it. Name error, y is not defined. Okay, but I, all these errors are being caught by line 24. So my program is not crashing here. I can do whatever I wish when I catch these errors, and that's pretty cool. So this one's actually another specific one. This one's going to be the keyboard interrupt. So I'm actually going to call input. And uh, let me give a message here too. Why don't I just say uh, type something? But I'm not going to type something. I'm going to type something that's supposed to crash my program here. I'm going to type Control C. But it says Control C is disabled. In fact, you could see the Control C character that I typed. It's right here. Uh, but of course, my program is still running. I haven't I wasn't able to stop my program okay uh, so the next one is 
let's see, which one was this? Trying to, trying to call a function on a data type that doesn't have that function. Attribute error. String object has no attribute sort. There you go. So these are all really interesting, and you can catch all of them specifically. That's why I'm actually printing out the type of the error right here, because you can actually, so like, you know, as an example, um, here, oh, let's try, let's try, uh, let's just try, let's try the, um, well, let's try the last one. Let's just, let's do this one first. Actually, we might try this one. So um, this one is, I've got a dictionary with some keys and values. But obviously, I don't have a key that says 9. So if I run this, I get key error. OK? So now, let's actually try and explicitly catch that one. So I can go accept key error. And then I'll go something like print. It doesn't have to be a print, but in this case, I'm just sending a message to the user. Uh, I could say something like uh, key does not exist. Okay, how about we put some exclamation marks in there? Okay, so in this case, if I run it, it says, so it caught it. Notice the line that's running here, right? Line uh, 26 did not run. It's line 17 that's running. Okay, so that's a specific catch. And um, finally, the last one I have ex as an example here is uh, calling range on a floating point number instead of an integer. And it says type error. Float object cannot be interpreted as an integer. Great. So. Um, so that's the that's how to essentially put blocks put put a try accept block into your code to catch either generic errors as in line 25 or perhaps catching only a specific error as in the ones that I have mentioned right there. So it's really handy. I really like this feature of Python. I've used it quite a lot and it's uh, it's great because um, especially uh, it's great for, for teachers because sometimes when you make programs that mark other people's programs, if they have errors, well then you can use try accept and uh, your program's not going to crash when, they're, when, when it's marking other people's code. So um, that's the end of the lesson today. Hope you enjoyed it.